can hear the whisper. Hey, Jace, it's me. Adam. <laughs> Hi, Adam. How are you? No, no I'm fine, thank no, you. No, it wasn't me whispering, Jace. Yeah. I'm, we're, just, we're, just trying, we're just trying to set her up so that she puts her best face forward. <laughs> she, she doesn't have to try. <laughs> uh, 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 video equipment you have to try. I see Krista's on. Hi, Krista. It's Adam. He's probably not on. Yeah, because he was alive just a few seconds ago. Yeah, yeah I see he's on, but he probably didn't hear me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Morning, Marcus. Hello. Hi. Good morning to you. Hi, Jess. How are you doing? Okay. Well, thanks. I think we're just waiting for Interveni and Florence, then we have the panel together. Okay. Morning to the newcomers. I'm here, Jess. Hi, morning. Morning, to morning, them. morning to yeah. others that I didn't greet. All right, Chavel. Crystal. Sonia? Uh, yes, Nchaveni. Morning, everyone. Can we, can we try that trick again? <laughs> okay, go ahead. So I can see it clearly. It's just at the back. Uh, if you could push your screen up a little bit. Push your screen forward a little bit. Ah, perfect. That's a bit better than the previous time. Oh, hey, okay. look at the man. Okay. Look at the man. Right, <laughs> yes. Oh, that's cool. Tanya, is, is my screen correctly aligned? Uh, Marcus, unfortunately, um, there's a sign there that looks like your video is not um, on. Oh, or there's a little camera and a, a line across it. I'm not sure what that means. Okay. I or I'm going to say you did. I'm at a bit of a noisy if I'm going to talk I'm at a bit of a area. Um, so I'm just going to remain muted. But thank you for inviting me to the webinar. I uh, will be present all the time. Thanks, Andre. Andre. Um, folks, this is Julia from Section 27. Uh, we have set it up to stream on YouTube. Marcus, I can see you now. And um, that's a great angle. Thanks. OK, thank you. Um, Denise, can I share the link with you uh, for the live stream on YouTube? All right, I'll, I'll chat to her on the phone. Um, and I'll also give Florence a call just to see whether she's, um, she's okay. But thanks, folks. Sorry, Julia, yes, you can. Awesome. If you can put that on the Blind SA Facebook page, then it should kind of uh, do a live feed. Okay. I'll try it now. I'll, I'll send it to you over email. Okay. Not a problem. I'm just going to grab a glass of water. I'll be back in a minute, everyone. How's Durban, Jace? It's pouring. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so the family were wanting to go to the beach in the morning and then come fetch me at half past 12. Uh -huh. Go to another activity. They had to change their mind and just drive on the beach side. <laughs> oh, goodness. <clears throat> it, it even rained a few drops here this morning early. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. SAFM phoned me, asked me to do an interview at 20 past six tomorrow morning. <laughs> I saw that. Got it. Goodness. For a few minutes. And Krista, you still got uh, the other uh, clock on. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, because I'm going to go by that to start. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, I'll I'll mute then.
community comes from. But just on a general note, that's not.
Yeah. So it's unmuted. Uh, um, so Hi, Jace. This is Julia. Um, just yeah. to say. I've gotten through to Florence and she's joining us momentarily. Um, so but I think we can, um, I wonder whether we should give a couple minutes for people to join and then we can begin. Uh, yeah, we can, we, will, we can start just uh, maybe by just after 11. Sounds great. Thanks, Jace. Okay, okay thanks. <clears throat> <clears throat> Good morning. Morning, Tommy. Ready. Hey, everybody. This on. Uh, good morning, Jace. Morning, everyone. Uh, Jace, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, Joe Malazzi here. Morning, good having you, Advocate uh, Malazzi. Ah, thank you. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you.
time is 11 o'clock a.m. Greetings, colleagues, and welcome to all of you who have joined uh, today's uh, webinar uh, to commemorate uh, the World Copyright and Book Day. This uh, webinar is being hosted uh, by Blind Essay and Section 27. Blind Essay is a national disabled people's organization established 75 years ago uh, to empower blind and partially sighted persons, as well as to advocate for the promotion and protection of uh, the basic human rights, as well as access uh, to services to ensure equal access to education, economic well being, independence, social, cultural, and sporting activities for blind and partially sighted persons. Many of you would know that for decades, blind and partially sighted people have been denied access to the printed works since the 1978 Copyright Act does not provide exceptions and limitations that make provision for the transcribing of Braille and other accessible formats. The lobby to advocate for copyright reform in South Africa has been a long struggle. And we thought that in March, 2019, there was a glimmer of light when both the National Assembly as well as the National Council of Provinces yeah. approved the Copyright Amendment Bill, only to find that it sat on the President's table then for close on 14 months. Blind SA initiated a motion in the Constitutional Court in May 2020, which resulted in the President referring the Copyright Amendment Bill back to Parliament, citing six constitutional areas of concern. You will hear in the webinar today, the efforts that have been made to, to alleviate this hardship of the book famine that faces blind and partially sighted persons. We've been very fortunate that Section 27, a public law firm, has assisted Blind Essay to submit a motion in the High Court in Pretoria. You will hear our speakers in a short while. The bio data, our moderator, Sanya will provide to you. But let me welcome Inchiveni, the president of Blind SA, Dr. Pravina, Sukrajilai, Marcus Lowe, Florence, who is from Uganda, who is going to provide an international perspective. And of course, our moderator, Sanya, who will in a few minutes be the moderator for the session. We'd like to welcome all of you to this session. We are aware that we have representatives from the NGO sector. We have disability rights activists. We have copyright activists, and we have academics, as well as IP practitioners with us. It is also possible that we'd like to welcome government officials 
who may be joining us and other guests. At the start of the session, I was also introduced to Advocate Malatsi, the Commissioner from the South African Human Rights Commission. So together with him and all the other guests, we'd like to welcome you to this webinar and wish you every success in all the activities that take place. We'd like to thank Section 27 and the legal teams that have assisted us in drafting our papers. We'd like to thank our advocacy team that assisted in putting together the various social media as well as video that we have launched to highlight the challenges we face. So it is my privilege and pleasure to hand you over to the team that will take us through the rest of the proceedings. Julia from section 27 will assist us now in screening two videos. And thereafter, Sanya will take over the moderation. Thank you again, welcome and participate actively in the question and answer section or the Q&A that uh, would take place after the presentations. So thank you very much. It was a revolution. Some it a struggle. It was a re uh, just to double check, Jace, can you hear the sound? Yes, we can. Fantastic. I'll start again. Thank you. It was a revolution. Some call it a struggle. I paid a heavy price. Our goal was equality. Some say we won the war. I say we are still fighting a book famine and apartheid copyright laws that refuse to transform. If that is what human rights looks like, I can't see it. The invention of the printing press opened the doors of education to the world. And when Braille was invented, it allowed blind people to read with their fingertips. But not all publishers want to transcribe books into Braille. This has caused a book famine for millions. In South Africa, exceptions to copyright law would help break the famine. But while the rest of the world embraces new technology and the fourth industrial revolution, copyright laws threaten to prosecute me as a thief. And blind people are still fighting a famine. Braille is no crime. Thanks, folks. Um, just to say that the links to those videos will be shared at the end of the meeting. We just don't want to clutter the, the chat box for now. But I think at this point, I'll hand over to Sanya, who's going to moderate the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. And thank you for that lovely welcome, Jace. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Sanya Samtani, and it is my pleasure to be your moderator this morning. Uh, I grew up in India by way of introduction and completed my legal education there as well. Most recently, I clerked at the Constitutional Court of South Africa in the latter half of 2018, and I'm currently a doctoral researcher at the University of Oxford. I have spent the last four years thinking and writing about access to educational materials under copyright from a human rights perspective. In my research, as I hope you will all see at some point, I demonstrate that these struggles around intellectual property and access to knowledge are ongoing and pervasive. India has recently seen such contestation around the photocopying 
of extracts of published materials as course packs for students. And Namibia is also undergoing a legislative reform process to update its copyright laws. Most recently, Professor Caroline Ngube, someone whom all of you must be familiar with, conducted a recent study under the aegis of the World Intellectual Property Organization. And she found that approximately 96 open and democratic societies around the world have exceptions in their copyright laws in order to enable accessible format shifting. As you all know, South Africa does not have these exceptions. So today's webinar is about the ongoing pervasive deprivation of access to educational materials and cultural materials for persons with disabilities. On World Book Day and World Copyright Day, it is important to note that this book famine is not something of the past. Access to materials under copyright is disproportionately onerous for persons with disabilities because of the Apartheid Era Copyright Act, as you all saw in those videos and heard in those videos. I thought I would give you a quick overview of what the Copyright Act does and then dive into introducing the panelists and then some housekeeping rules and then move on to the speakers one by one. So very short, in a very short sort of way, uh, the Copyright Act creates a monopoly over using works. Authors and creators have control over any use of the work that they create, including photocopies, scans, transmissions, broadcasts, etc. A marketplace model is then created from this control in that for the justification that this market will give value and economic incentives to the creators to innovate further. But what we have seen is the birth of the copyright industry. And the aim is that this incentive will lead to innovation and further increase the sum of knowledge for the whole community at large. But in reality, as we have all heard, the market has not catered to people with disabilities. And so a large percentage of that community is excluded from access. The Copyright Act does not contain an exception to this monopoly, which is what we've been talking about, to enable people with disabilities to shift formats. This on the face of it limits the equal right of access to educational materials, the equal right of access to information and cultural participation, the right to dignity, amongst other rights that are present in South Africa's Bill of Rights. The Copyright Amendment Bill, as Chase discussed, wants to fix this problem by introducing an exception, as discussed, which would mean that people with disabilities of all kinds can adapt materials under copyright so that they can access it because at the moment, it's not possible to access it. After Parliament passed the bill in 2019, the President did not sign it and instead sent it back to Parliament after several representations were made by international and local publishing lobbies. However, I think it's really important to note that none of these representations were against the exception for people with disabilities. However, despite this, the bill still has not been passed and remains in Parliament perpetuating what is likely an unconstitutional situation. So we've got four panelists today to talk about various aspects of this issue uh, to commemorate World Book Day. Our first panelist will be Nchaveni Nechituni. Nchaveni is the president of Blind SA, the South African Braille Authority, and the vice chairperson of the South African Disability Alliance. He also represents South Africa as a member at large at the International Council on English Braille, he holds an LLB degree from UNISA and is currently completing a master in laws degree, specializing in international human rights law. Turning now to Marcus, Marcus Lowe attended the World Intellectual Property Organization's 2013 Diplomatic Conference in Marrakesh as a member of the civil society um, coalition uh, negotiating the Marrakesh Treaty. He has written various articles about the Marrakesh Treaty and has contributed to various submissions on the South Africa on South Africa's Copyright Amendment Bill. He previously worked as head of policy communications and research at Treatment Action Campaign. He's a published novelist and an editor of the widely read public interest health magazine Spotlight. He's here in his personal capacity, his in, and his involvement in copyright reforms also in his personal capacity. Our third panelist for the day is Dr. Praveena Sukraj Eli. Dr. Praveena is a totally blind, motivated woman who holds four degrees, including Master of Arts in Political Science and a PhD in Public Policy. 
her doctoral thesis, achieved before the age of 30, focused on South African legislation and policy on inclusive education of persons with visual impairments in basic and higher education. She's an advocate of the High Court of South Africa and a senior state advocate managing the projects of domestic violence, femicide, and access to courts for persons with disabilities at the National Department of Justice. Dr. Sukraj Ela is the first vice president of the International Council for the Education of People with Visual Impairments and currently heads, she currently represents ICEVI on the Board of Accessible Books Consortium, which we will be talking about both with and represents the World Blind Union on the Inclusive Education Task Team of the International Disability Alliance. Our fourth panelist is Florence Ndagire. Florence is the first visually impaired female lawyer in Uganda. She holds a Bachelor of Laws degree from Akarere University and completed an LLM in International and European Human Rights Law at the University of Leeds in the UK. Florence has worked as a disability policy advisor at the World Blind Union and is currently the current chairperson of the UN Women's Civil Society and Advisory Group of East and Southern Africa. She is currently enrolled at Makerere University in partnership with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine for her PhD, researching on access to reproductive health services by persons with disabilities in Uganda. So after that short introduction to our star-studded panel this morning, I want to turn to some quick housekeeping rules, which include hot keys for accessibility for Zoom, in case you're unfamiliar with them. So the first request we have is that we request people to stay muted for the duration of the webinar. We would be grateful if you did not unmute yourself um, while people are speaking. We will also take questions at the very end. So at that point in time, please raise your hand to ask a question to a panelist and then we will take your question. It is, we encourage you not to use the chat box when people are speaking, as it makes it difficult for screen reader users to hear what people are saying. If people really wish to send messages, then they should do so while someone is not speaking at the time. So please refrain from using the chat box while people are speaking. Uh, in terms of the hotkeys, for those using Windows or a PC, to mute or unmute your audio, hold and uh, press the Alt and A key at the same time, Alt A. For, for, for turning the video on and off, it's Alt V, Alt and V. To raise or to drop your hand, it's Alt and Y. And an alternative way of unmuting yourself is, you, you will be muted at the moment, so you can unmute yourself by holding down the space bar while speaking and letting go when it's finished. Um, on smart, if you've joined us on smartphones, then your mute and unmute button will be at the bottom left corner of your screen. It's for muting and unmuting, the bottom left corner of your screen. The video on and off button is one flick to the right of the mute and unmute button. The more button is on the bottom right corner, which opens functions like raise or drop hand, clap hand, etc. So I'm happy to go over this again in the Q&A if required, but uh, just note again, uh, please don't use the chat box when people are speaking. Thank you so much. I'm now going to finally kick off the webinar uh, with Nshaveni at the very beginning. Nshaveni, would you please discuss what exactly accessible format shifting is? how the current Copyright Act does not provide for it, and what are its consequences for people with disabilities? Sorry, it was playing tricks with me. Sorry for that. Uh, good, good morning, colleagues, and good morning to Sanya. Accessible format shifting or converting reading material in different formats is a process involving human intervention and specific actions resulting in a particular format being produced. It is important to note that traditionally, most people understood hard copy braille to be the only accessible format used by blind people to access literary works. People then later began 
to move toward audio, which was faster in reading, easy and cheaper to produce. But with the advent of digital media, other expanded and improved accessibility options became prevalent, such as DAISY format uh, books, downloadable uh, digital books, and international exchange of books that have already been adapted to be accessible. Development in technology such as refreshable braille and text to speech software thus have brought a new dimension to accessibility of literary works in alternative formats. In the current Copyright Act, of 1978, exceptions for production of reading materials is not provided for, in that blind people still have to request publishers to grant them permission to produce the book in alternative accessible formats. This process is, in, is inhospitable because it purely rests on the publisher's will to either grant or decline permission, sometimes refusal done arbitrarily. The worst is that a blind or partially sighted person may have to suffer double uh, jeopardy because they have to pay twice for the material when publishers put as a requirement that a requester must first purchase a, a hard copy print uh, material before converting it into alternative format, which process the requester must, sorry, which process the requester still has to pay exorbitantly uh, before acquiring the, the book itself. Consequently, Blind and partially sighted or otherwise print disabled people are denied their constitutional rights to equality, which is protected in terms of section nine, right to education, which is protected in terms of section 29, and right to the language protected in terms of uh, section 30 of the constitution of the Republic of South Africa. Furthermore, South Africa, as a signatory to the UNCRPD, by continuing to apply the 1978 Act in its current form, violates the provisions of, amongst others, Article 4, General Obligations, Article 21, Freedom of Expression, Opinion, and Access to Information, to the extent that they have a freedom to choose formats by which to receive information or reading material. And Article 24, which is right to freedom to education. Resultantly, this has unfortunately led to a book famine in that fewer than a shocking 0.5% of published uh, works in South Africa currently uh, are said to be inaccessible. I mean, in the accessible and uh, sorry, in the accessible formats of our choice. Then the hardship that comes with that is that we have a lot of material which is inaccessible which blind and uh, otherwise print disabled people cannot enjoy. I will take my first part, uh, Sanya, to this end, and uh, I will consolidate further when the second part comes into picture. Thank you, Inshaveni. That was very informative. I think now people have a better sense of, of what accessible formats are and the the widespread book famine that's currently taking place. I'd like to now turn to Praveena 
to give us an account of, of the links between right to education specifically and copyright law, and specifically how the Copyright Act impacts these rights. It would be great, Praveena, if you could also talk about your work with the International Council for Education of People with Visual Impairment Impairments as well. Praveena, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sanya. Um, I think I want to want to start off with the statement that access to books and access to education are clearly two intrinsically linked phenomena. Books are the key to knowledge, as we always hear, and lay the foundations for education. The link between the right to education for visually impaired children and copyright law is well articulated by the International Council for the Education of People with Visual Impairment, otherwise known as ICVI. It is evident that countries with restrictive copyright law have resulted in children with visual impairments and print disabilities being negatively impacted and severely disadvantaged in equal access and opportunities to education. As education forms the bedrock, and is the cornerstone of all other human rights, the discrimination and inequality faced by children with visual impairments has a far-reaching and ripple effect, resulting in this unfairness and disadvantage impacting their overall development, social economic opportunities, and lifelong chances into, adult, into adulthood and beyond. Now, I just want to talk to you a little bit about ICVI. The mission of ICVI is to promote quality and appropriate education for learners with visual impairment and those learners with visual impairment who have additional disabilities. The mission is aligned with Article 24 and SDG 4. The goals and the mission of ICVI are achieved by the hard work of a global executive committee um, and its international, regional, and national member partners. Uh, we provide technical and advocacy support in the field of education for children with visual impairment, for UN, UN agencies, international NGOs, national NGOs, governments, educators, etc. For children with visual impairment, equitable quality education services and programs must include access to curriculum-based information and textbooks on the same basis as sighted children. Learners with visual impairment require opportunities to create, read, and share books and other cultural, uh, other cultural materials in accessible formats. Restrictive copyright law in many countries, including South Africa, has resulted in what is now commonly known as the book famine. Despite the passing of SDG 4 and Article 24 of the UNCRPD and the Mar Marrakesh Treaty, far too many children with visual impairments in developing countries do not get a chance to learn. Most don't get their textbooks in accessible formats. However, this could easily be changed by harnessing technology, whether it's mainstream access technology, assistive technology, whether it's low cost, high cost, et cetera, to make information accessible. Technology has made it possible to digitize textbooks which, which make them accessible and collaborations with publishers can then ensure that future titles are made born accessible and easily av available in alternative suitable formats as a standard practice. ICVI is in full support of the ratification of the Marrakesh Treaty and the implementation of fair and balanced copyright law. I want to quote something uh, that was said by WIPO. Without books, journals, and magazines, people are cut out of life. They cannot get an education or participate fully in society. They do not, they do not therefore realize their full potential. This is, this is not just a loss for them, 
but it is a serious loss to the economy and for the societies that they live in. <clears throat> Based on this, we want to say that ICVI encourages governments to implement policies that require publishers to produce born accessible textbooks and curriculum materials in formats that are usable directly from the publisher by children with visual impairments. We encourage the, publish, the publishing industries, self-publishing authors, copyright um, organizations, disabled, disabled people's organizations to come together to build government, business and communities awareness around accessible content and inclusive publishing. I, I want to stop there, Sanya, as regards um, the link between education uh, and the right to read and the, the role of uh, ICBI with accessible books. Thank you, Praveena. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we'll come back to you at a later point in time to continue. But before that, uh, I'd like to come back to Nshaveni, actually, to ask specifically about the Copyright Amendment Bill and the court case that Blind SA and Section 27 have filed. Can you talk to us a little bit about how the Copyright Amendment Bill and the case seek to fix this problem? And why are these reforms urgent in the current landscape? And could you take us through a few of the main arguments, please? Thank you. <clears throat> the Copyright Amendment Bill, which is uh, known as the CAB, seeks to address this problem by introducing Section 19D, which deals with the general exceptions regarding protection of copyright work for persons with disabilities. As the name suggests, Section 19D provides for a general exception on access to reading materials, and it further encourage, uh, encapsulates an element of cross-border sharing of uh, copyrighted literary works. We believe this is a bold step towards the right direction, especially in the light of the fact that there is no one contesting the provisions of Section 19D, let alone the President. On 16 June 2020, the President referred the CAB back to Parliament having raised six points which are believed to be his constitutional reservations, namely incorrect tagging, retrospective and arbitrary deprivations of property, fair use, impermissible delegation of legislative powers to the minister, the copyright exceptions, and international treaty imp implications. Not satisfied by the referral of the CAB back to parliament, in view of the ostensible further delay, Blind SA further put together interventions, including marching to the union buildings and handing over a memorandum to the presidency on 10 December 2020, in order to force government to speed up the debates on the cab so that a finality can be reached at the earliest convenience. The memorandum was intended to the president, the national speaker of parliament, minister of trade, industry and competition, amongst others. It is shocking to note that none of these bothered to respond by the deadline of 27 January, 2021. <clears throat> Blander then solicited the services of section 27 in litigating against government and had already served papers on the said respondents. Litigation is instituted at the South African, sorry, at the South Houghton High Court in order to challenge apartheid copyright laws and fight for the human rights of persons who are blind or visually impaired. 
Through this process, we seek to appropriate, we seek appropriate relief provided to us by the constitution as follows. We are submitting that the court must declare the current Copyright Act unconstitutional and order the state to reform the Copyright uh, Act urgently. Otherwise, since Section 19D is not contested, even by the president, we submit to the court to declare the temp to declare the temporary reading in of Section 19D to provide expected exceptions in accessing literary works in alternative formats to the blind and partially sighted and otherwise print disabled persons in South Africa. It is our belief <coughs> that should the passage of CAB not conclude, not be concluded 12 months uh, of operation of the temporary reading in of section 19D, the reading in should thus be made permanent. The reforms are urgent in that South Africa had lagged so much behind in terms of signing and acceding to the Marrakesh Treaty. And this perpetuates deprivation of access to reading materials to the blind and otherwise print disabled people, including learners and students, of course. The number of available publications accessible to blind and otherwise print disabled are still shockingly low. For the past 27 years, blind and otherwise print disabled people have been living in an unconstitutional setup because of the application of Copyright Act of 1978 in its current form. Despite the de democratic uh, dispensation South Africa earned in 1994, the matter <clears throat> had delayed for far too long, thus exacerbating the deprivation of rights experienced by blind and otherwise print disabled people in South Africa. Blind and otherwise uh, print disabled people still have to beg for permission to access material in accessible format. The reform shall get rid of the existing double jeopardy experienced by blind people uh, and otherwise uh, print disabled. We argue that <clears throat> government must enable blind and otherwise print disabled people to live a complete life where sort of through upholding of their rights by respecting, promoting, protecting and fulfilling their rights as directed by section seven, subsection two of the constitution of the Republic of South Africa. Furthermore, the delay on the passage of the cab or the signing of the signing and acceding to the Marrakesh Treaty continues to perpetuate the book famine for the blind and otherwise print disabled uh, people. Um, it is important that we should also note some few quotes uh, from our uh, very senior people in terms of uh, the Copyright Act. Former Constitutional Court Justice Zakia Koop said the following, even though I am an empowered blind person, the reading deficit was so big uh, when I was a child that even today, my children have read more books than I have. I therefore believe that it is extremely urgent for books to be made available for blind and visually impaired pe people in formats that they prefer 
It could be electronic, uh, tape recorded, or braille, so that they can be, uh, they can advance themselves. The other quote I would want us to focus on is the spotlight editor, uh, Marcus Law, in which case he says, throughout my life, I have often not been able to access books required for study and work in appropriate formats. Books that fellow students or uh, colleagues could simply purchase or lend from a library have often not been accessible to me in inappropriate formats. The last one is from the school teacher who says the following, persons without visual impairments are able to buy a book and just read it, but a person who is blind or who has visual impairments must first buy a book and then find someone on for someone to uh, convert it into an accessible format. Sometimes not sometimes you have to wait months or even years until you are able to obtain a particular book in an accessible format. The majority of special schools are encountering <clears throat> serious problems with obtaining accessibly formatted uh, textbooks. These challenges include the high cost of obtaining material uh, on master uh, copies and issues related to obtaining consent under the copyright. Thank you so much, Sanya, for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Nchaveni. That was a very clear picture of the deplorable situation in terms of the onerousness that lies on people with disabilities to actually access materials. Um, Nchaveni mentioned the Marrakesh Treaty to facilitate access to published works for persons who are blind, visually impaired, or otherwise print disabled. That was concluded in 2013. Parliament has bound up the passing of the CAB with the accession of the Marrakesh Treaty. So I'd like to now turn to Marcus to discuss what the Marrakesh Treaty is exactly, what its aims are, and how it will work to fix the ongoing deprivation of access, particularly because Marcus was involved as a part of the civil society group negotiating the treaty. Over to you, Marcus. Uh, thank you, Sonia. And Thank you to everyone attending. Um, I'll get into Marrakesh in a moment, but I just want to speak a little bit about my personal experience. Um, so as mentioned before, often books are simply not available in accessible formats. So you go to university, you're told you need X, Y, Z textbooks, and you just can't find them in accessible formats. So you buy them, you pay someone to scan them, and you go through that process. Um, an important nuance is that sometimes books are available, but they're not available in sufficiently accessible formats. So at the moment, I'm studying at UCT. Um, there's a book I, need, I needed. I purchased it from the Kindle store, um, like anyone else can do. The book is text to speech enabled, so I can read most of it, but critically, there's a lot of formulas in, it, in the book. It's about infectious disease modeling. So there's a lot of mathematics in it. And when I encounter mathematics, the screen reader just reads image. Now, what happens there is they didn't take the trouble to create accessible mathematics. They just took pictures of the formulas. Um, so this is quite interesting. It's, it, it, what it means is there's a book that's partially accessible, but the important parts are not accessible. And 
I find it particularly worrying in the case of something like mathematics, where um, it's a field where you know some blind people succeed in mathematics, but it's quite rare. And then you encounter this kind of issue where um, supposedly accessible books aren't really accessible because of this. So there's a lot of nuance to this. Sometimes someone will tell you, but an accessible version of a book is available on the market, you can buy it, but then when you buy it, you run into these problems. So that's just a nuance I wanted to add to the discussions. So to understand the Marrakesh Treaty, it's worth going back some years. Um, as mentioned earlier, a lot of countries have copyright exceptions in their laws. Um, one interesting example is the United States in 1996, they introduced something called the Chaffee Amendment, C-H-A-F-E-E. -E. Now, the Chaffee Amendment is exactly the kind of copyright exception that we've been talking about. It says, if you need to make an accessible format book for a blind person, you can do that without the permission of the copyright holder. So that is in the capitalist United States of America, um, they thought a law like that is totally fine 25 years ago. Um, by contrast, in South Africa, as has been pointed out, we don't have a law like that. So in the example that I mentioned, if I want to take the Skindle book and I want to try and rework those images and make those um, formulas accessible, I'm not allowed to do that. I'm not allowed to reformat that book. The law, our law actively prevents me from reformatting a book that I need for my education. So that is the situation we are in South Africa. Um, now, many countries have many different types of laws that differ in many ways. So some clever people, some um, very strategically thinking activists and um, people at the World Blind Union, People at a, an NGO in the US called Knowledge Ecology International, some academics saw this problem in the mid 2000s. They had some meetings, they got together and thought what solutions might look like. Um, and they started thinking about a treaty. And eventually, some governments got involved. Um, early on, the I think Brazilian government in particular played an important role, the Ecuadorian government. They took some of those ideas to the World Intellectual Property Organization, um, where there's a committee that deals with copyright. Um, and we don't need to go into the whole history, but that eventually, um, I mean, the idea caught on and it led to a so-called diplomatic conference in 2013 in Marrakesh, Morocco. And that's the conference where the, you know, these conferences are held to finalize Treaties. So it's two weeks of negotiations where the, um, you know, they go into it with a draft treaty, but at this conference, they finalize the details and at the end of it, you have an agreed treaty. So there was a long process leading to this. It was quite contested. Um, in Marrakesh, there was a huge publishing industry lobby. Um, quite interesting, interesting in some of the most aggressive lobbying actually came from the Motion Picture Association of America, um, which is slightly hard to fathom why they were so against the idea of making books accessible to, to blind persons. Um, myself and others, um, Jace, who's on this webinar, was also there. We lobbied from the other side in favor of a progressive treaty that would actually make a difference in people's lives. Um, and as with any process, the eventual treaty was to some extent a compromise. Um, negotiators had to consider all the sides and the final treaty is what they agreed upon. So it is the consensus between all these governments. Um, so that is, I think that's quite important to, to note that, you know, some people would try to portray these changes in law is controversial, but um, I think the process shows that it's not. It's an agreed treaty. The treaty has now been, well, it's now in um, 
in, act, enacted in 79 countries, um, including the United States, the United Kingdom, the EU, countries with huge publish, publishing industries. They've looked at the treaty and they've concluded that the balance is such that it addresses the needs of blind people without harming industry. So that's why these countries are all willing to sign. Many um, developing countries have also implemented the treaty, Nigeria, India, some of our neighboring countries, Botswana, Zimbabwe. Um, so it's quite remarkable that we're so far behind the curve in this. So what does the Marrakesh Treaty do precisely? Well, it, in my view, does two key things. Firstly, it implements a copyright exception, like we discussed. So it says, if you enact this treaty in your country, your law should essentially say that it's legal to make um, accessible versions of books um, without the permission of the copyright holder, um, as long as you make it for use by people who are blind um, or otherwise print disabled. So that is the first part of it. Um, that solves a lot of the problems we discussed so far. But the second key element of the Marrakesh Treaty is that it allows for books to be shared across borders. And this is, um, it's hard to, to grasp the full relevance of this if you don't experience this daily. But what this means in practice is that if a book has already been made accessible, um, you know, for example, in the United States, this textbook that I need, if it's in a library there in an accessible format, um, enacting Marrakesh would mean I could simply connect to that library if they're satisfied with my credentials that I'm someone who needs the book legitimately, they can just send me the book. Um, so enacting Marrakesh in more countries means all of this, um, you know, accessible book libraries can share books across borders. Now, an additional benefit of that is that in South Africa at the moment, we still spend a lot of time and effort redoing work that's already been done. So if I get a book, um, I have to make an accessible copy of it all over again, whereas accessible copies already exist elsewhere. So we um, end up redoing work that's been done in other countries. Um, so if we implement Marrakesh, one of the benefits would be that we can focus on making South African books accessible um, rather than redoing work that's done elsewhere. So those two things together, um, I think, make for an extremely powerful combination. So, um, so yeah, so why have we not implemented these changes in South Africa? Um, I think the history is quite interesting. As pointed out before, um, our current copyright law is not constitutional in this regard. So these are really, um, changes we should have made soon after 1996. And we could, can't really say we didn't know because at the same time, the US implemented some of these changes. Um, be that as it may, in 2013, when the Marrakesh Treaty came around, South Africa did play a positive role in that. Um, in fact, we've, I think, constantly been quite good in negotiation, negotiations in these international forums. Um, we've often argued on the progressive side of things, would be it health or copyright. Um, so government has supported the treaty prior to its finalization in Marrakesh. The South African government was part of the African group that was also very strong and negotiated in favor of, a, of an effective treaty. Um, government statements after the agreement of the treaty made it clear that our intent is to implement the treaty here. Um, it took some time, as mentioned, it was included in the Copyright Amendment Bill. Um, and that history was just recapped. Um, we, two years ago in 2019, we thought 
when the bill was sent to the president that, you know, we've made it through, but the bill was sent back for other reasons. Um, so we've, we've, yeah, we've kind of been the victim of, of having this reform bundled with other reforms. Um, so since then, I think there's a feeling that the, the progress on the bill has stalled. Um, and I think that's part of what's led to, to blindness, that feeling we have to take this to court. Um, I deposed uh, an affidavit in support, in support of a court application. Um, so I guess the, the key point there is that there are clearly some in government and some in parliament who have seen copyright reform as important. But the much more important point is that it has not been a political priority. And that is clear from the fact that it's eight years after Marrakesh. And South Africa has not implemented these changes. Um, that to me says that at the highest levels, the South African government, the presidency is indifferent to the needs of people with disabilities. Um, and we have really been left with no other choice but to take this matter to court. Um, and as others mentioned, it's 25 years after our constitution was promulgated and we, we still have to deal with this kind of thing. So, sorry, I think I've gone on a bit long, so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcus. That was very powerful. And to hear about your experience at Marrakesh was also quite exciting. Um, I'd like to turn now to the Ugandan perspective that Florence is here to provide us. Uganda acceded to the Marrakesh Treaty on the 23rd of April, 2018. So Florence, could you please tell us a little bit about the ratification process in Uganda and talk to us also a little bit about if access has improved, um, if it has, how has it improved? Uh, and we would also be keen to hear a little bit about your role as the human rights policy advisor at the World Blind Union in connection with this. So Florence, over to you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Nasanya, I mean Sanya, for the opportunity to be part of the panel. Uh, I'll start with a bit of history. Uh, the members of the Uganda National Association of the Blind attended the negotiation process in Morocco that was organized by uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization that led into the promulgation of the Marrakesh Treaty. Knowing and realizing the importance of Marrakesh in providing accessible information and that would lead to quality education, quality uh, economic empowerment, job creation and job opportunities. They returned to Uganda and a stakeholder meeting was held in collaboration with the Uganda National Association of the Blind and uh, Sight Savers International. I was a member of the Uganda National Association of the Blind and we decided to lay down strategies of how we could lobby our government to ratify the Marrakesh Treaty. First, uh, we had the WBU campaign uh, advisor of the Marrakesh, Chris Friend, and he took us through some of the local actions of advocating for the ratification of the Marrakesh. So the conference, uh, the sixth Africa conference was to happen in Kampala uh, in 2014, even though it was postponed in 2015. And the, idea, the first idea was to negotiate with the Minister of Justice and Constitutional Affairs to find avenues of ratifying the Marrakesh. So we did a number of things. Uh, we selected a, a campaign team that had John Christine Sima from the Uganda National Association of the Blind and Vitris Guzu to spearhead the process of the ratification. We established contact with the Minister uh, Minister of Justice and Constitutional Affairs, Justice Bat Katrebe, and invited him to be uh, the guest of honor for the opening ceremony uh, of the Africa Forum. And in that forum, we asked him 
uh, to support the ratification of the Marrakesh. So even before that, we developed a position paper detailing the challenges uh, blind and people with print disabilities are facing in Uganda in terms of accessing information. Uh, we also uh, suggested recommendations uh, and opportunities if the Marrakesh was to be ratified. So some of the recommendation was that since uh, Uganda was being reviewed for the implementation of the CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, if the Marrakesh was ratified, it would support the implementation of inclusive education under Article 24. Uh, it would support uh, the right to employment under Article 27, the right to health under Article 25, and uh, a number of other articles. Of course, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities was Uganda's political agenda in meeting the rights of persons with disabilities. So the minister was very positive and he agreed to support the ratification process. So he directed us to the director of the Uganda Bureau of Registration Services, um, who was supposed to provide us with guidance on how to take the process forward. So this is the guidance that uh, the director gave us. He said, she said that it was important to have the cabinet memo drafted to seek consent from the Uganda copyright law and intellectual property uh, in order for the ratification to take place, to set the agenda among the blind and partially sighted people who would continue the advocacy process so that uh, uh, the publishers, authors, and librarians would be persuaded to have the ratification to accept the ratification and provide accessible formats of their books and published work. Uh, so from this point, several meetings took place. Uh, uh, we met the Uganda Copyright Law in their conference and we presented the same position paper. That conference was held in 2014. We also uh, had another meeting with parliamentarians from Eastern Southern Africa uh, in 2016. And uh, we met the permanent secretary to the Minister of Gender and asked him to uh, develop a consent letter that we submitted to uh, the director of the Uganda Registration uh, Services Bureau and uh, the Uganda Intellectual Property Copyright. So these uh, uh, two entities responded to the consent and uh, the permanent secretary developed uh, the, the cabinet memo. Now, the, the process of the cabinet memo took a bit of time because we had to wait for the certificate of financing to be granted. So the minister in charge of justice and constitutional affairs submitted this memo to cabinet. And uh, of course, they, they were, uh, there was a bit of process of approval and then it was sent to the Ministry of Finance in 2016. So until 2018, that's when we received a certificate of, uh, of finance in, and uh, when we received that, uh, an instrument of ratification was sent to the World Intellectual Property Organization and the American Treaty was ratified. This was a big, a big uh, success for the Uganda National Association of the Blind in partnership with Sight Savers and other blind people in Uganda. Now, this certificate of financing has done a lot of things in terms of ensuring that uh, the accessible formats of published works meant of the neighboring of the world. In, sorry of the Corporate Law and a Neighboring Act to be amended to incorporate uh, provisions of the Marrakesh Treaty. And uh, the Certificate of Financing guarantees resources in terms of the budget uh, to pro provide transcription of published work in all accessible formats, including Braille, audio, large print, and the digital format. Yes, that is a process and we really celebrate it. But now 
in terms of whether access to published work has improved, uh, yes, a little, because we still have to continue uh, advocating and advocating. So what is happening now is that uh, in terms of uh, the education process, uh, primary school children have received transcribed textbooks into Braille, large print. And because we don't have enough technology, we don't have enough computers, those ones can't access uh, digital information. For secondary school, the same is happening, but if, of course in phases, a few books have been transcribed. But at the law school, most of the laws now are accessible. Yeah, they have a format of the digital that is really accessible for all. Um, then uh, my role as, as the human rights policy advisor in regard to the Marrakesh, the World Blind Union. First of all, uh, while the World Blind Union would develop a concept uh, on how to push, the, uh, to encourage more countries to ratify the Marrakesh. And one of the things that we agreed upon is that wherever you attend a conference, the first thing to talk about is America and to train them a little on the local actions they could take to take the America treaty forward and to encourage their governments to ratify. The other thing is that it was also important to meet several publishers to continue the lobbying because once they accept, then ratification will be much easier. Um, also, it was also important to publish stories of lack of access to information online to, in order to uh, contribute to the literature so that people would understand that persons with print and blind, uh, sorry, blind and persons with print disabilities uh, have a challenge that needs to be corrected. So, uh, I went uh, for, to several countries, including Kenya, I went to Morocco, uh, not Morocco, it's Mongolia, Mozambique. I went to Canada, training people on the Marrakesh. And even when I didn't have the opportunity to go to those countries, I had to conduct webinars online in, in terms of implementation of the sustainable development goals. But I would talk about the Marrakesh Treaty because it contributes to goal one on ending poverty, goal three, on improving healthier lives, goal four on accessing inclusive and quality education, goal 10 on reducing inequalities, and goal eight on inclusive economies. So for people, especially for countries that have ratified the sustainable development goals, it's very easy for them to put it in their national development plan to ensure that accessible formats are provided. Now back to Uganda, uh, much as we have the opportunity to amend the Copyright and Neighboring Act of 2006, uh, it hasn't been possible because we had two amendments that had been submitted. That is the Mental Health Act of 2019, so Mental Health Bill of 2019 and the Persons with Disabilities Act of 2020. So those went through first and then now the amendment of the Copyright and Neighboring Act will follow. <laughs> yeah, but apparently we have the budget for implementing uh, the Marrakesh Treaty. Uh, <clears throat> my appeal to the countries that have been ratified is that it's very important for you to set the agenda by mobilizing the community of blind and persons with print disabilities and getting to know the people in charge of policies and decision-making. You have to invent the space by paying for the policy dialogues to take place because you will not have an opportunity to attend the closed door meetings that are discussed by policymakers. But I am sure if you put this agenda forward, uh, your government will accept ratify. You just need to tell them about the opportunities of the Marrakesh in ensuring that uh, during the high level political forum, it will be one of the things to be reported on, or in ensuring that during the review of the CRPD, uh, of course, many rights will be supported by the implementation of the Marrakesh. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Florence. On that optimistic note, I'd like to turn to Praveena to talk to us a little bit about what types of initiatives like the Accessible Books Consortium, etc., could South Africa access after ratification of the Marrakesh Treaty? And also, what are the practical consequences of these initiatives? What sort of benefits could that bring to people in South Africa? Over to you, Praveena. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sanya. Um, it goes, it goes without saying that once the Marrakesh Treaty has been ratified and once copyright law has been passed in any country, including South Africa, there must be measures in place to operationalize and implement the provisions contained in the treaty or in the law. If, if, this, if the spirit and the ethos contained in the treaty and in the law is not brought to life, then once again, we will have paper law that is collecting dust. Um, it's, it's almost like having a wonderfully bright, shiny red Porsche with the flat battery and me behind its wheel. So this is, this is why we need to always bear in mind that when we looking at, once we implement and once, once we implement copyright law and once we ratify the Marrakesh Treaty, it is imperative that the provisions within the act is operationalized. Now, I, I want to talk, uh, discuss today um, a very fantastic initiative, which I am a part of being on the Accessible Books um, Consortium Board. Um, the, Ac the Accessible Books Consortium, let me refer to it as the ABC, was launched on the 30th of June, 2014, as a public-private partnership led by WIPO, but including rights holders, that is publishers, self-publishing authors, authorized entities, uh, vis the visually impaired constituency, uh, donors, etc. Now the main object and focus of the ABC, like the Marrakesh Treaty, is to get books and other material into the hands, the homes, the schools of people with visual impairments. Due to time constraints, I'm just going to touch on a few of the activities that are currently being conducted by the Accessible uh, Books Consortium since its establishment. Now, one of the highlights is the Accessible Global Book Service. Um, the other one is the brand new supplementary application, which could be a game changer for accessing books for people with visual imp impairment across the world. The other one, uh, activity is the cap Capacity Building Initiative. And the other uh, activity that I'll just touch on is the Charter on Accessible Publishing. Now, the ABC uh, Global Book Service. The backbone of the Global Book Service are the authorized ent entities participating in the ABC. Authorized entities refer to libraries for the blind, organizations who's serving people with visual impairment, um, et cetera, as, as defined in the Marrakesh Treaty. Authorized entities, you will be able to look at that de definition. Currently, there are more than 71 authorized entities participating in the Accessible Books Consortium. Now, just to clarify, authorized entities who can participate um, in the Accessible uh, Books con uh, Consortium include those um, uh, authorized entities in countries who have ratified the Marrakesh Treaty and those countries who have not ratified the Marrakesh Treaty. Currently, the South African Library for the Blind, although South Africa has not ratified the Marrakesh Treaty, we are part of the Accessible Books Consortium. Um, so the global, the, what exactly is the Global Book Service? It's an online catalog of accessible books that can be utilized by libraries participating in the ABC. Basically, it's a library's library, so to speak. Authorized entities can list and share the accessible titles among themselves to give their visually impaired and present disabled consumers access to a larger range of accessible titles. Hence, there is no need to reinvent the wheel and duplicate resources, et cetera, as was mentioned uh, by Marcus earlier. Now, how exactly does it work? And, and I want to speak to you about operationalizing. How would, this, how would we actually operationalize this? So basically you would have, if you had two countries like Australia and Canada, 
who have ratified the Marrakesh Treaty, the moment a visually impaired consumer from a library in Australia requested a book that was available in a library in Canada, Library for the Blind in Canada, um, no copyright permission would be required, etc. The library in Canada would upload the file, the, the library in Australia would download the file and give it to the visually impaired person in Australia. Unfortunately, in the case of, for example, a South African visually impaired person, if I had to request a book from the Library for the Blind in South Africa, they would need to request the book from Australia. However, they would first need to obtain copyright permission from a permission from the copyright owner so that that book can then be uploaded by the library in Australia and then downloaded in South Africa and then given to me. So automatically you can see that by us not ratifying by South Africa, not having ratified the Marrakesh Treaty and not having copyright law, the fact that we part of the Accessible Books Consortium doesn't really help us. Uh, it's, it, it, it helps us to a degree, but it doesn't put us on the same playing field as other visually impaired uh, people in other countries where the Marrakesh Treaty has been ratified. Now I want to, now, as you can see, because the online catalog is, is own, only contains metadata in terms of the title, the author, the genre, et cetera. Um, it, it does require a bit of human intervention. It requires a bit of time because you need a library who will upload, download, you need the technical resources, et cetera. So the ABC then we thought uh, as a board, how do we make the service a little bit more uh, operationally friendly? How do we actually then, it was, uh, people were taking a, a long time to receive books when they requested it, et cetera. So what, what we now did is we developed a supplementary application to amplify the global book service. Uh, this could really be a game changer. It's currently being piloted. However, once again, it can only be piloted in countries who have ratified the Marrakesh Treaty and who have domesticated copyright law. Here again, South Africa, we excluded from being part of this pilot. So what this, what this pilot now has made available is the identified authorized entities will upload their digital files on the ABC cloud and all pilot uh, authorized entities can then exchange these books among themselves. Uh, beneficiaries of the authorized entities can query, look, research what books are available and immediately download those books by themselves from the ABC cloud. This will clear, has clearly made it more books accessible for visually impaired uh, persons in countries who are members of those pilot authorized entities. Now, we are hoping that once we once the results from the pilot come back, that we can actually amp expand the service to more authorized entities so that it will be much easier for uh, people with visual impairments in various countries to exchange books within and across borders. Um, I want to quickly touch on the capacity building um, initiative that has been uh, started by ABC. It has the focus has been on developing countries, and the aim has been to convert ex books that are currently not accessible into alternative accessible formats, and then also to train and assist uh, authorized uh, authorized entities, organizations for the blind, and work together with publishers, etc., to ensure that books that are new, newly released books are born accessible. That means from the start, they can be used by both sighted and visually impaired people. So the, the other, the last thing that I want to discuss is the uh, publisher's charter that we have at ABC. And this is a way that we advocating and caucusing with publishers to, uh, to, to show and demonstrate their commitment to inclusive publishing and to ensure that we have born um, accessible books. And in this way, this public-private partnership has shown that this, we can really work together to make, to oper operationalize uh, the Marrakesh Treaty. 
Uh, with that, I, I want to conclude by saying we have made significant inroads in making more and more books um, accessible to visually impaired people throughout the world. It is for the first time that uh, uh, visually impaired children in certain developing countries have actually got books in their native language that they never had before. So I, I think what, what I want to conclude by saying is, us as South Africa, we really need to come on board to ensure that our visually impaired children and our people with visual impairments going forward are actually placed on an equal playing field as other pe visually impaired people across the world who have in fact ratified the Marrakesh Treaty because this has clearly opened doors uh, for people, for learners with visual impairment and for people with visual impairment uh, through their adulthood. Um, thanks, thanks for that, uh, the opportunity, Sanya. Thank you so much, Praveena, and many, many thanks to our wonderful panelists, Nshaveni, Praveena, Marcus, and Florence. The perspectives from these different aspects has been absolutely fascinating. And now I'd like to open up the opportunity for the audience members to also raise questions to our wonderful panelists. I just want to flag that we've got about five to six minutes left for the scheduled end of this webinar but we might run over time a little bit because this wonderful opportunity uh, is quite rare. And um, if people would like to stay and ask questions, they're very welcome to do that. But for those who have to leave at uh, 12.30, they're very welcome to do that and we'll send you a recording, Section 27 will send you a recording link as soon as it's available. So um, just to quickly run through, oh, wonderful. I can already see hands, that's fantastic. Just to quickly run through the housekeeping uh, rules again to raise your hand. Um, uh, you press Alt Y on your PC and on your smartphone. Uh, the more button, which is on the bottom right corner, opens the functions like raise or drop hand. So I can see one hand. That's Karen Lazar. Karen, would you like to ask your question? Yes, sure. Can you hear me, Sanya? Yeah, I can hear you well. Thanks. Uh, Good morning, everyone. I'm Karen. Thank you to the panelists and to Section 27 for a fascinating morning. I'll be brief. I've got a couple of comments leading to a question. I'm a lecturer in English education at WITS and at the Pius Lange School of Advocacy. I'm physically disabled by a stroke, but I am sighted. And as a writer, I actually wanted to look at some of the language and vocabulary around blindness. If that's okay, Sanya, may I continue? Yes, please, Karen, go ahead. So um, I've been doing a bit of reading and I'm very aware of visual metaphors in language. This may feel redundant, but it does relate to Pravina's point. Very often we speak about reading the world, reading the situation reading others, those sorts of things. And I'd like again to emphasize that reading books does give one access to a much broader human, human education, to imaginative expansion. So I think we need to broaden the idea of what reading entails. And I was about to say that reading gives us a glimpse into other worlds. And then I became aware that the word glimpse is visual. Can we come up with a non-visual word? So many of our words, and even in section 27, we speak about perspective and point of view. So I'd like to ask the panelists, do you find this kind of metaphoric language in any way limiting? Should we be looking for other vocab? Thanks, Sanya. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, among the panelists, I'd like to direct this question first to Marcus and then Nishaveni. If you have anything to add to that, please, you can go ahead and add to that. And if, of course, the other panelists have comments, then you may go ahead after that. So, Marcus. Thank you. Um, I think people have different views on what is what they find problematic or offensive. Personally, I'm not too offended by that kind of use of language. And the kind of thing that I do think is fairly problematic is when someone says something like, um, you have to be blind not to understand what's happening here. 
So that kind of use I'm uncomfortable with. But the rest, um, yeah, I'd like to hear what others say. I'm not, I'm not too bothered by it. Thanks. Shaveni? We can't hear you in Shaveni. Wait, we still can't hear you. Shaveni, are you there? Let's move now to Praveena and we'll come back to you, Chaveni. Hopefully the sound can be sorted out before then. Praveena, do you have any thoughts on this? Would you please share? Uh, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I, I, as, as Marcus indicated, it is a personal um, stance that one would take on this. However, I think it just depends on the way in which the metaphor is used. Um, what I what I would want to say, and this is my message, maybe you know, to 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 all of us um, who are currently against the copyright and the Marrakesh Treaty, is let's not be short sighted. And I'm very happy with that that metaphor. Thanks, Anya. I see Anshaveni is unmuted now. Fantastic. Thank you, Praveena. Anshaveni, let's move to you. Unfortunately, there seems to be a problem with the sound. Let's take Florence quickly and then we can try again with Nshaveni because I know that there's another question in the audience. So Florence, would you would you be willing to speak? Thank you. Uh, in terms of the, limit, the limited language, uh, about whether blind people understand their situation. I believe the experience is the best teacher. For many decades, we have not been uh, getting access to uh, published work, and people with, who are partially sight, sorry, people who are sighted have been getting it without any complaints. Now is the time. What we need now is the accessible published work. We do not uh, really care about the language that is used, but I still believe leave the experience is the best teacher. We need to use this experience of blind people not accessing the information to educate or to create awareness to the rest of the community uh, in order to bring about equality in education and other uh, research perspectives. Thank you, Florence. Let's try in Shaveni again now. Shaveni, are you on call? Can, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, okay. yeah, now they, it seems like my microphone was giving me problems. Yes, I, I, as others had said, I don't think I'll have any particular problem with the usage of, particularly the examples that were given, the view, the perspective. Uh, I would want to believe that if I if applied in their proper context, in their broad context, they shouldn't pose any specific uh, offensive uh, connotation to uh, to anything to anyone. Uh, so, so to me, it's it's uh, it's more on how one would 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 view that. But personally, I wouldn't take any offense on that, as others had said, really. Well, thank you so much, panelists. On that so note of solidarity, I'd like to turn to the second question in the audience. I see Rahul has a question. Rahul, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Shania. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Yes, Go ahead. yes excellent. Uh, thanks so much. So, uh, hi, everyone. Um, I have a couple of questions. I'm a lawyer 
from India and uh, I happen to be blind since birth. Uh, so this is an issue of great uh, personal interest to me in addition to being an academic interest. Um, so the questions are really these. Uh, one is just to sort of understand if there's any scope for people not from South Africa or for international organizations working on blindness related issues to intervene in the litigation um, that was spoken about to be able to speak to the importance of, uh, you know, the court adopting the position that Section 27 is advocating. So I just wanted to understand if there's any scope for that. The second question is to Praveena in particular, which is, uh, you spoke about the uh, what the ABC does and, and uh, sort of the way the cross-border sharing provision can be operationalized by libraries. But my question was, as a blind individual myself, are there ways in which I can make use of that provision uh, in the treaty? And like, I come from India, as I said, which has ratified the treaty. And let's say, as in the US has also recently ratified it, if I'm not mistaken. So for instance, if I wanted to access books that are available in the American Bookshare Library, uh, because they have a much wider collection of books than does their Indian counterpart. So it, do there currently exist ways for me to be able to make use of that or the Hathi Trust Library and stuff like that uh, and, you know, access the books that they have in accessible formats, which would, which would mostly mean soft copy form in this context. Thank you. Thank you, Rahul. Um, so uh, just to say, uh, maybe we should take the second question first. Praveena, would you like to um, respond to Rahul's question about the ABC? In the Marrakesh Treaty. Yes, thanks. Thanks for the question, uh, Rahul. Just to say that um, uh, India has been a part of the capacity building in, uh, initiatives of ABC, and uh, they have managed to convert uh, various books into accessible formats and produce born accessible of uh, books with yeah. the assistance with a, um, of ABC and ABC. As the, the how you would be able to access the books is you would need to be a member of a library for the blind um, or even, for example, um, Daisy India or whichever other authorized entity that is within India itself. And mm -hmm. that authorized entity, once you are beneficiary, because you would have an agreement <laughs> with the library that you are, yeah. a, that library would know that you you are a visually impaired person or a print disabled person. And based on that, they will allow you to have access to all the materials. So let's say they are one of the participating pilot in um, authorized entities going forward. The whole, all the, the accessible books uh, that are digi digitally available on the ABC cloud, you as a member of the authorized entity in India would be able to have access to the, 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 the books of the other authorized entity. So the way of entry into the ABC is by being a member of the authorized entity in your country. I see, I see. Thank you. Thank I you, hope Sanya. that answers that. Sorry. Thanks, uh, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Rahul. Thank you, Sanya. Thank you, Praveena. Uh, Rahul, I'm afraid, um, so we're almost out of time. Could you please repeat the first part of your question? Um, so that sure, uh, it department. was, yeah, sure. It wasn't if there are ways, pathways for people not from South Africa to constructively intervene in the litigation being currently uh, that's currently underway. Thank you, Rahul. I think I'll direct that to Nshaveni. Nshaveni, would you like to respond to that? Yes. Um, the, the, there is a way of uh, uh, entities or people who are not South Africans or in South Africa to can. Uh, join in as Amiki Kuriai. We have had uh, already a request from uh, ICJ <clears throat> um, to be permitted to come and uh, 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 give their perspective in court as Amiki Amikas Kuriai. So, yes, there is that uh, scope. Wonderful. I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rahul, and thank you, Nishaveni, for that response as well. Um, so we are running out of time, and unless there are no further questions, I'd like to close the webinar 
by saying thank you so much to all four panelists for taking time out to provide their perspectives on this particular issue. It's such an important issue and on the occasion of World Book Day and World Copyright Day, it's important to note that not everyone has access to materials and that the situation is, requires an urgent remedy. Um, I'd like to also thank the team at Section 27 for putting everything together, Julia, Fernas, and everyone else who is involved. Um, thank you, everyone, and have a nice day. Just uh, thanks, thanks very much from the Section 27 side. We'd really like to thank the panelists and Sonia, the, mod the moderator, for all of their contributions to this discussion. I think it was really insightful and very engaging. Um, and just a, a huge congratulations to Sonia, who submitted her PhD yesterday, um, but still made the time to have this conversation and to engage with us all. And thanks, thanks everybody for joining and for staying this long. Um, and we look forward to engaging with you further about, about the litigation that's coming up. Um, and hopefully we can to collaborate and to, and to be allies in this, in this campaign. Uh, but thank you so much for joining all of us. And I think if people would like to you know, say goodbye, we can, we can do that now. The recording will be shared with everybody who wants to be. Thanks, everybody. Congratulations, Sonia. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you from Blind SA to all the Bye. panelists and all the audience. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Oh, my word. <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs>